it's my great privilege to introduce our last speaker of Planks 2021, Professor Elvira Fortunat, joining us from Évora in Portugal. Um, so Professor Fortunat is Vice Rector at NOVA and Director of the Materials Research Center of the Associate Laboratory, the Institute of Nanostructures, Nanomodeling and Nanofabrication. Uh, Professor Fortunat pioneered the European research on transparent electronics, namely thin film transistors based on oxide semiconductors, demonstrating that oxide materials may be used as true semiconductors. She is co-inventor co of paper electronics concept worldwide. In 2008, she won an advanced grant from the European Research Council. And then in 2018, she won a second ERC of the amount of 3.5 million euros. Our research team is exploring novel active properties in advanced and sustainable multifunctional materials, including oxides, as well as novel electronic active materials, including alternative deposition methods with the main objective of developing eco-friendly technologies and devices to be used and exploited in electronic circuits made of stable amorphous semiconductors able to serve large area, smart, flexible and comfortable surface electronics. She's a member of the Academy of Engineering, the European Academy of Science, the Lisbon Academy of Science and the Academy Europea. She also belongs to the Board of Trustees of the Luso American Development Foundation and is a former Chief Scientific Advisor of the European Commission. Since 2019, she's also been coordinating the SPHERE project, an European platform for supporting and implementing plans for gender equality in academia and research. Uh, a very impressive uh, biography. Uh, without further ado, you're about to hear about a very exciting field, that of transparent electronics. And so without further ado, uh, Elvira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your kind of introduction. It is also for me a pleasure to be part of your uh, workshop or conference, the Planks 2021. And also, since this is a competition, I wish all the best for the winners and also for the, uh, the other ones. So I will start briefly my, my presentation. It will be about uh, transparent electronics. And I hope you will enjoy this new area of, um, uh, for, uh, for semiconductors. So uh, the title is Metal Oxide Materials as a Sustainable Alternative to Low Cost and Flexible Electronics. As it was mentioned, uh, I'm a professor at the Material Science Department at Faculty of Science and Technology at Nova University in Lisbon in Portugal. So just for you to have an idea where I'm located, Nova University has nine uh, faculties, uh, ranging from medicine, law, economics, uh, and all the other um, conventional ones. The, the one related to science and technology is based on the south region of, uh, of Lisbon. So in this, uh, in this picture, you can see the area, the campus, of the Faculty of Science and Technology. And just in front of you, we have the Tegus River and the, the Lisbon city. So we are on the south part of, of the, riv the, the river. And our main laborato laboratories are just here located on the right part of the, of the, the picture. In terms of the areas we have inside our group, we work uh, on transparent electronics, also we work on paper electronics, and besides these two big areas, we perform also some activity on electrochemical devices, also on biosensors and microfluidics, and finally we work, we have a, another line a scientific research line on solar cells. And in this particular area, we are exploiting the use of nanoplasmonics. And at the end, what we want to have is more sustainable uh, solar cells and also with a higher uh, efficiency. So in terms of the outline, I will start to, to present you a little bit about transparent electronics. I will go through the history, some applications and where we are. After that, I will, we will share with you the actual needs. I will present some low cost technology, low temperature processes, and also sustainability, because as you know, we are forced to work in these areas. And finally, I will present you some future perspectives. And in that regard, I will show you some recent results on P-type, thin-film transistors, and also other technology processes that we have in our, in our laboratory. So in terms of transparent electronics, this, uh, I may say that this, this was a dream that became reality. As it was mentioned by, by Pedro, uh, these, uh, 
this was a, a subject of my first ERC. So my first ERC was, uh, the title was Invisible and was dealing exactly with the use or the, the, the possibility to exploit the new materials or new metal oxides as truly semiconductors specifically to uh, thin film applications. Uh, so uh, in terms of the history of transparent electronics, uh, this is a recent area. It appears in 2004 uh, with this very nice paper published at, um, at NITER by Professor Ozono from Tokyo Institute of Technology. And it shows that it is possible to produce amorphous uh, metal oxides at room temperature, but with a very high mobility. Because usually if you are dealing with semiconductors, uh, for example, if you are if you are, if you need to have a very high mobility, you, you need to have a crystalline material. Uh, on the other way, if you if you are depositing or if you if you need to use a, a low deposition process in order to be compatible with flexible applications, uh, usually the material is not crystalline or even polycrystalline. We have an amorphous material. So in this area, in the area of amorphous or metal oxides, it is possible to have the, the good of these two, two worlds. We have an amorphous structure and simultaneously we can achieve a very high mobility and a very good uh, carrier uh, transport properties. Because, in fact, we are dealing not with the conventional uh, covalent semiconductor. In fact, we have a mixture of uh, ionic and covalent semiconductor. And the disorder do not affect the transport properties of these uh, new materials. So we, can, uh, we are saying now that we are in the presence of a new class of electronic materials. So we can uh, work with copper oxide, with zinc oxide, with indium oxide, or tin oxide. And besides these binary materials, you can also mix the, some of them and exploit the different properties of these uh, very interesting metal oxide uh, materials. So uh, just uh, two years after this discovery in 2004, some prototypes of active matrices uh, start to appear, especially from Japan and Korea, where the display area is, uh, is placed. Uh, I didn't mention uh, at the beginning, but these metal oxides, metal oxide semiconductors will be used on thin film transistors. And as you know, uh, for all the, the displays that we have, uh, the, our mobile phones, uh, the televisions uh, and uh, the, the computers, the display itself uh, is based with pixels. The image is composed with pixels and each pixel has behind a thin film transistor. And these new materials will, will replace, in some cases it is already replaced because this is already available in the market with at some commercial devices. The, sil the amorphous silicon is replaced by these metal oxides. So this is why this is so important for the display area. And also here we have a, a video that appears in 2011 where you can see a large window and besides the window, we have simultaneously embedded in the window a transparent display. And this is only possible because we are using not only transparent semiconductors, but also because we are using transparent conductors and transparent dielectric materials. Because to build a, a transistor, we need to, to use at least these three types of different materials. So some examples that we have uh, uh, we have done in our laboratory, and especially if you are uh, working with the companies, uh, we have, for example, a, a patent with uh, Samsung at, in in South Korea. Korea, it is quite important to perform st stable devices, and stability is an issue. And for example, in these uh, graphics, I don't uh, go too much uh, in detail. But for example, if you take a look on the on the graphic on the on the right and uh, the upper part of the screen, we have a typical IV characteristic. Usually, this is called a transfer, the transfer characteristic of the transistor. And we have uh, different plots, even for devices that have not been encapsulated. But even after 10 months, the electrical characteristics, the characteristics are exactly the same, which means that the devices or the materials are quite stable. Another issue uh, 
especially if you are working with the industries, besides stability is reproducibility. It's quite important to, to have reproducibility, especially if we are looking for large area displays. The it all of the devices, all of the transistors, they need to have the same electrical properties. And here in these uh, transfer characteristics, we, you have again 168 uh, transfer plots for all these transistors, and they are coincident with again, which means that the devices are quite reproducible. So here, uh, a, a prototype then also in 2012, uh, in conjunction with the TNO in uh, in Netherlands uh, within a, an Orama, uh, an European project called Oram. It was a, a, a very large uh, European uh, project, and it is possible to show to have a flexible OLED based display. All the active metrics was done in Caparica in our laboratories and the encapsulation and the, the part, the integration with the, the display using OLEDs uh, have been done in um, at Teno in uh, Netherlands. So here, these, uh, these materials, and especially gallium, medium, zinc oxide, is already adopted by the industry. Of course, the, the main advantages are the high resolution. We are dealing with transparent materials. Besides that, they present a high mobility and also a high on-off ratio, also a high current, especially for, and this is quite important, if you are um, working or if you are building an OLED display and not an LCD one, uh, in third, they have a low power consum consumption and also they present low noise interference, especially if you are dealing with the touch screens. Also, some years ago in 2012, we, we, we have done this, uh, this book on transparent oxide electronics. And if you are interested in this topic, we can take a look. And we have some uh, different chapters uh, ranging from M type, ranging from the materials itself, the semiconductors, the conductors, the dielectrics, and also some uh, uh, applications on uh, paper electronics. And at the end, also some uh, works on, not only on it, 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 thin film transistors, but also on electronic uh, integrated circuits because uh, we are dealing with the semiconductors. So we, we are not only making uh, discrete TFTs, but also we are able and uh, we are producing uh, uh, integrated circuits. Also, uh, I got my first uh, uh, ERC in 2008, and in 2011, it was uh, also considered by ERC as a success story due to the huge interest and also the applicability and interest of the industry for this type of materials and uh, devices. So in terms of the actual needs and also the global de demands, uh, go towards high performance and low cost electronics with sustainable materials, is that possible? So this is what we are looking for now. And maybe flexible electronics is a golden opportunity for oxide TFTs. So just for you to be familiar about the device that I'm working, that uh, I'm talking about, uh, we are uh, working on uh, thin film transistors. This is a very simple uh, transistor. Usually we start with a substrate. It is a piece of glass, is a piece, uh, is a polymer or even a paper. We deposit a, a gate, um, a metal or a oxide conductor. After that, we deposit the, the dielectric, the insulator layer. And at the end, we deposit the thin film uh, semiconductor based on these metal oxides. Of course, for having or for getting a transparent electronics, a full transparent device, we need to have also a transparent conductor, usually based on uh, some grids, uh, some, uh, for example, uh, carbon nanotube, nanotubes or even uh, silver nanowires or even uh, uh, a transparent conductor, a dielectric layer based on aluminum oxide, for example. And after that, the thin film semiconductor based on uh, zinc oxide and is family. So this is a, a typical field effect transistor and it works quite well. We, we just changed the modulation of the channel uh, on the, 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 conductance, the conductance at the semiconductor channel. 
and basically this is a on off device it the the current goes or the current doesn't goes this is how we, it is this is why it call, it call, it is named a field effect transistor so this is also the evolution of electronics so we have we are now uh, using a lot of uh, uh, trillions of uh, uh, specific devices and especially if we are looking for the uh, the internet of things the the data and also the the cloud and all these uh, demands from uh, the industry and from the society of course we need to have uh, we need to spread electronics everywhere we need to to put uh, single electronics for all the objects but of course we need to reduce the cost for these electronics otherwise it is uh, quite rather difficult to implement uh, conventional electronics for uh, very low cost uh, uh, products so also this is the, the, the challenges and the, also the what we are looking for. So we are, uh, uh, the, in terms of the requirements for future ubiquitous electronics, uh, we are looking for ultra cheap and disposable electronics. So we are looking for inks, scalable production of electronic inks for uh, printing electronics, for example, for seamless integration. Also for power management, we need to have ultra low power electronics and also energy conversion storage storage devices. And at the end, we need to have efficient wireless communication systems, which means high speed electronics and also new devices for Wi-Fi. So, and also in terms of the sustainable development goals, uh, we are looking for sustainable approaches also we need to have low cost technologies and at the end also we need to to have to process these materials at low temperature processes and also the technologies that we are looking are non-pollutant so we are also looking for these uh, sustainable approaches that have been um, asked in 2015 by the united nations so in terms of the need for sustainable approaches, so material subject, uh, we are looking for material subjects to the biggest increase in their demand are mostly driven by large area electronic applications. At this moment, uh, the industry is already using indium, gallium, zinc oxide materials, but uh, we need to face the alternatives since indium, as it is indicated in this graphic, this was done by the European Commission and is the, the list of critical raw materials. So the ones in this uh, grey square, we need to find alternatives. And as you can see, indium and gallium are there and we need to, to replace these materials by alternatives. And what we are looking for is for zinc and tin since zinc and tin they are abundant also they are non-toxic and we are looking and we are using these metal oxides based on these elements to to have more sustainable electronics also we are looking for the need of low cost technologies and for example here uh, uh, i present the uh, there is a comparison between a conventional uh, microelectronic process using vacuum and photolithography for example and a printing pro process for example uh, if uh, we, we are looking for a um, uh, conventional microelectronic process we need to have six steps and for example if we compare for the printing process we just need to have one step to build the same, to make more or less the same. So we have almost a 64 cost reduction because we are not using a vacuum, vacuum systems and also gas lines and photolithography. So we can reduce a lot of the costs if we replace, for example, a conventional photolithography process by a printing process. Of course, this is not uh, suitable for all the areas of electronics, but for some specific applications, this is this is uh, an alternative. And also, uh, we are facing a huge increase in terms of uh, printing resolution. And nowadays, uh, the printing we have some printing processes that, that that are quite similar to the ones that we are using inside a clean room. 
So in terms of flow temperature processes, in this graphic, I present you uh, uh, an example of some uh, TFTs that have been produced by synthesis, not by physical means, like by sputtering or other physical processes. And what we observe during the, the last years is a decrease in terms of the final temperature deposition process. Of course, for the synthesis or for chemistry, you need to heat the, the, the solution. You need to promote all, all the chemical reactions. You need to evaporate the part of the solvents. But what we have been observed is a decrease in terms of the temperature. And nowadays, we are able to produce uh, TFTs, for example, with the nice and uh, good properties by using a very low uh, uh, chemical approach. And simul simultaneously, we increase the mobility of these devices. The electrical mobility is like the, is like, it's not a golden figure, but it's, it's like a figure of merit for these devices. And what we are looking always is for a high mobility, which means that we are looking for a high speed. And besides decreasing the temperature, we observe an increase in terms of the electrical mobility since uh, even from the chemistry side, we are uh, using, uh, uh, we know more deeply about all these reaction processes. Also, we are using not only temperature, but also we are using other sources, other sources of, of energy like laser and so on. And uh, we increase, we, it is possible to, to have nowadays devices, thin film transistors, exactly in some cases with superior electrical performance than, than the same material, the same devices done by a physical technique like sputtering, for example. Now I will present you some examples that we have inside our laboratory at CENIMAT, the Materials Research Center from Nova University of Lisbon. So here and following the sustainable approaches, some examples of TFTs then using zinc tin oxide. In that case, they have been produced by RF sputtering at 180 degrees, which is compatible with the use of polymeric substrates. Here, the transfer characteristics on top and on the bottom, the output characteristics of uh, these devices. Again, uh, we are also looking for sustainable, other sustainable approaches. Uh, instead of using sputtering or these expensive uh, clean room uh, system uh, equipments, uh, we are uh, using, for example, uh, uh, chemistry, uh, uh, chemistry synthesis. So we just spin coated the ZTO TFTs, uh, and they are quite stable. And also, the, the mobility is not uh, is not bad. So it is possible to produce devices with mobilities around three square centimeter per, per volt per second. And just for you to have an idea, in terms of the actual uh, TFTs that we are using in our computers and televisions, which, which are based on amorphosilicon, the mobility of amorphosilicon is around one square centimeter per volt per, per second. And also, uh, it is quite easy to use, for example, just a spin coating, a spin coater, and to prepare some uh, solutions and spin on top of uh, a piece of glass and to build all the device, it is very easy to, to, to obtain uh, three times more for instance, the mobility of the commercial ones. Also, this is another example of some um, spin coated uh, devices. So here we have uh, indium gallium zinc oxide. So we are mimicking what is used by the industry in terms of the high performance uh, TFTs. And here we have a cross section, a high resolution cross section of a TFT where you can identify all the layers. And for example, the, the green one, this very thin layer of some tens of nanometers are based on amorphous indium gallium zinc oxide. This is just also uh, to tell you that besides the low cost uh, of these materials, the amount of material that we need to use is very, very thin. So it's some, just some tens of, uh, of nanometers. Uh, since we are looking for uh, always for uh, decreasing the, the process temperature, we start with 400 and 350 degrees. And in order to decrease the, the, the temperature process of these uh, 
devices than by uh, uh, a solution approach, we are using what is called a combustion reaction. So in that way, we are able to reduce uh, by almost 200 degrees the final, the final temperature. And uh, besides that, if we had, uh, for example, a UV radiation, so during the deposition of the material, if besides eating the, 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 the substrate, if we shine some uh, uh, UV radiation, it is also possible to even to decrease the final deposition temperature. And it is possible, for example, to build uh, devices at 150 50 degrees, which is uh, quite low and fully compatible with the use of polymeric uh, substrates. So this is, a, again, an example of a flexible uh, TFT uh, done on a piece of uh, polymer using wow. these, uh, uh, this combining technology between uh, solution combustion and uh, UV radiation. And also this, uh, in terms of printed electronics, it is al already possible to print all the layers that we have in our uh, this place, for example, this was done by Evonik uh, company, where in, on the right you have a picture of uh, uh, a display and all the layers of the display, and uh, this is rather complex, have been printed. Just to show you how this is the, the main advantages of, and opportunities of these uh, materials. Uh, besides TFTs, also we are working and we are exploiting the use of these oxide materials for other applications, like for example for X-ray direct detectors. This is an example that we have in collaboration with Bologna University in Italy. Also, uh, other applications uh, we are, for example, this was done in our laboratory, so we are also it is possible to also to produce full high resolution displays even at 180 degrees and in that case we have 13 layers so it's rather difficult to deposit 13 layers uh, in sequence and also also we are working on other circuit blocks for system on foil like inverters some subtractors amplifiers so since we are working with semiconductors, so we are able to produce any kind of uh, integrated circuit. Also, we are exploiting and we are applying this uh, technology to textiles. So another application is to embed in uh, textiles uh, electronics and specific low cost electronics. Also, this was done in, uh, in conjunction with um, an European project that was uh, that was coordinated by Cambridge University. And just uh, to finish just some, um, just to, to show you some future perspectives. Uh, we are now also working and we are exploiting or using perovskites, not only for solar cells, but uh, perovskites are, allied perovskites are quite good semiconductors and we achieve to, to make uh, P-type TFTs using this type of uh, materials. As you know, in the area of metal oxides, they are, they are basically N-type. And if you are looking, for example, for CMOS applications, we need to have both P-type and N-type uh, semiconductors. And these uh, uh, allied pair of skites, they work quite well as P-type TFTs. And here we have some examples. This is... Uh, at that time, this was not yet published, but this is already published at the ACS and Nano. And also we are able to perform these uh, TFTs on, uh, on polymeric substrates, even uh, by using a very low, a very low process uh, uh, temperature. Also, uh, uh, as it was mentioned, I got now a second uh, uh, ERC and the, the main idea is to exploit, uh, to to continue to exploit the, the use of these uh, low cost metal oxides for electronics and for electronics, not only displays, but also for the energy application and also for memories. But the main idea is to use uh, laser technology to simultaneously produce, to promote all the chemical, all the photochemical reactions within the materials and simultaneously patterning the, 
the, the material. So by using a solution ap approach in combination with the laser process, it is possible to use, to exploit the energy of the laser radiation to promote all the photochemical reactions within the material and simultaneously to pattern the, the devices. So this is more or less what we are doing within, within this project. So we have already some preliminary results. For example, this was an example of a, a capacitor based on aluminum oxide. And for example, the, the black line was done at 200 degrees during 30 minutes. And the blue one is for, for the same capacitor but it was processed by a CO2 laser within a, a infrared radiation during, for example, one minute, but simultaneously we pattern the devices, the, the layers. So also we are exploiting this uh, technology for build graphene. I'm not a graphene person, but uh, I need a lot of, uh, to, to have electrodes for uh, the devices that I'm uh, producing. And for example, this is in 2014, it was uh, proposed by the first time by Professor Tool from Rice University, the use of uh, CO2 lasers for um, transforming, for carbon carbonize, if I may say, the surface of some uh, biopolymers and to transform the surface of the polymers to graphene. This is very easy because again, we can use the laser beam to convert the surface of, uh, of the polymer or another material. Uh, we need to have carbon and to convert the surface of the, the material to, to graphene and to use this graphene, for example, in that case is for a biosensor. We use this for an, uh, the detection of uh, ant antibiotics, but uh, is very useful and also this is uh, flexible. Also, we are exploiting the same uh, principle. In that case, the application is not a biosensor, it's a UV sensor. So we deposit, we pattern the electrodes, the graphene electrodes, and we deposit on top of the electrode some uh, zinc oxide. And uh, this is the results of, for example, uh, a UV sensor. Another example is to use the same technology to build the paper PCB. Uh, we wet a piece of paper on a silver nitrate. We pass the laser and we build all the, the metal lines using, uh, we promote the reactions to, to transform the silver nitrate to me metallic silver and we build in a 3D along the thickness of the paper, a PCB on paper. And also here are some examples. This was done by some uh, uh, master students. So this is more or less the, the main advantages of this type of technology. Instead of uh, we are using a digital selective grow and this is the conventional grow. So of course we have much more uh, advantages. We have a direct synthesis of nanomaterials without further integration or assembly steps required, which is always a problem if you are working with the nanostructures, nanomaterials, nanoparticles. It is extremely simple and inexpensive setup for device fabrication. Uh, there is a minimal usage of chemicals and energy for the nanomaterial synthesis. And, uh, that there is a formation of mechan mechanical and electrical robust contact between interfaces because they are built all together. So just uh, in terms of final remarks, taking into account the unique properties of metal oxide, uh, different forms, films or nanostructures, they are not restricted to thin films and transistors or to transparent applications. So we are using, we are in the presence of new semiconductors and we can exploit this for electronics, for integrated circuits, for sensors, whatever. We can apply these materials to biosensors, detectors for different areas like memories, intelligent techs, uh, among others. The use of a maskless and non-vacuum approaches is a promising area, not only to replace silicon in conventional applications, but especially to open new areas of uh, applications. And of course, we would like, I would like to thank all the team that is working within our group. We used to say, uh, we like very much this African proverb, 
If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we prefer to go together since we want to go far. And finally, uh, I, I need to acknowledge uh, not only the recent projects, but the, uh, the, 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 the projects that we have been obtained not only from national funds, from FCT and Portugal Bintwin, and now the, the new funds, but especially to ERC, since we obtained already in our group seven ERCs, and we are quite proud to, to, to obtain, to achieve this and i'm finished i hope you enjoy and uh, you are uh, now able to understand a little bit more about transparent electronics and maybe some of you we will follow this new and exciting uh, area in your uh, career thank you thank you professor for an incredible talk uh i'll open the floor to um any questions so we have one from barbara let me find you uh, uh oh, just a second uh, i need so just a second so i think you should be able to unmute and turn on your camera if you want otherwise i'll read your question not so barbara asks is this the technology used in those flexible mobile hi, phones hi, can you oh, hear me hi. yeah yes sorry i was with bad internet so i will think uh, first thank you for your great talk uh, i was wondering if this technology you talked to us about is the one used on those flexible uh, mobile phones that are appearing nowadays Yes, I guess so. Usually when we, we purchase a mobile phone, we know the final mark, the final brand. And sometimes it's not mentioned the display is coming from where, the microprocessor is from where. But uh, yes, we have already some um, uh, mobile phones. The first ones from, uh, that are starting to use this technology are from Sharp and some of the ones the, from Apple also. But sometimes okay. the, the industries, they don't tell us from which company or what is exactly the technology inside. But of course, the, we have already some applications of this new technology. That's why it was also so far, we start this in 2004 and only after less than 10 years, you have already some, some devices, some products using this technology commercially and do you plan to apply them on any other on any other devices yes because this is used this is in fact we are working my area is materials and we are exploiting a particular class of materials which are semiconductors and semiconductors are used for electronics for integrated circuits for sensors for whatever you want especially if you are looking okay. for flexible applications, if you are looking for transparent things, they have a huge advantage. Thank you very much. Which is not possible with silicon. Silicon is opaque and silicon, the silicon wafers are performed at the, is a, um, the, the, the crystals are grown using Shokrowski technology or float zone and we need to melt silicon at 100 500 degrees <laughs> to make your your wafers okay thank you uh, thank you very any, much any other questions if not i'll i'll, I'll ask mine because this is my field uh, so if and... you want i can share i can share my public cash ah, okay you you record it but I can share my slides if you if you okay. want. No yeah, problem. if you email them to, to me, I'll be able to share them yeah, with, uh, because with everyone else. Because what I present is already published, so no, <laughs> no secrets around. <laughs> uh, I, while other people think about more questions, I just have a, uh, I'm quite a, a curious about this actually. You've shown essentially that with very cheap materials, you can get things comparable with silicon, gallium arsenide, similar mobilities, even better. You've shown 
to be able to decrease the annealing temperature, lots of things. I'm just, I would, I mean, this is a breakthrough. I would, I was just curious of when all of this started, uh, how, how did you even think about using this kind of materials? Because it, it would have never, if no one, if I didn't, if I couldn't see the data, if anyone just told me, let's do a transistor out of paper, it just sounds a very <laughs> crazy idea almost. So I was just curious, yeah. what, what was the, the process? How did, uh, how did it happen, essentially? The, the issue uh, related to sustainability was already is at the uh, DNA of our group, if I may say. So we are always looking for uh, sustainable materials for abundant, non-toxic. We are also looking for um, low temperature depositions because we start to work uh, uh, many years ago on flexible, on flexible applications. Uh, so we are looking for low temperature processes. And uh, we start uh, working with these metal oxides at the beginning of the group. At that time, I, I even was not there because these materials are already used on solar cells. With the more of the solar cell is a, is a transparent conductor that simultaneously is a conductor, but also depending on the thickness, we can tune the, 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 the thickness of this, this layer. Usually it was ITO in tin oxide. We can tune the thickness also in order to avoid the reflection of the radiation, just also to increase the solar efficiency. So we work already with this type of, um, of materials and we start to use these materials not only as conductors, but also to try to exploit because they are quite obedient. They, they are very nice. They are, they are quite polite. We, we can change, for example, the amount of oxygen and we can have an insulator or a conductor. We can play with more than 10 to nine, nine orders of magnitude in terms of conductivity by using the same materials, the same material. And this is amazing because yeah. we start with sputtering, with a sputtering system. We just need to use a single target and you play with the percentage of oxygen during the position. And you can have the same transistor using the same material as a conductor, as a semiconductor and as a dielectric. So we start more, more or less with this, and we succeed. And, uh, and, and at the end, these, these uh, transistors, they are better. The electrical performances are better than amorphosilicon. Yeah. We achieve already mobilities around 100 square, um, uh, square centimeter per volt per, per second. And amorphosilicon is one. And besides that, for building, for depositing a morphosilicon, you need to use silane, you need to use diborane, you need to use phosphine for the doping, and these are quite dangerous gases. So if you have a leak inside your laboratory, it's a, it's a problem. So we turn a little bit around, and at the end, we have only advantages. This, this is why the industry was so inter interested. Yeah, no, that's uh, incredible. And yeah. I'm thinking of the sort of... And at the end, Piper is a dielectric material, is an insulator. Why not to exploit flexibility and dielectric properties simultaneously? Yeah. Now, when I think of MB people and everything they have to do, entire rooms, just to increase mobility a little bit, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> incredible. Um, of course, are... this is not a solution for all the problems, or I don't want to replace my microprocessor with this type of oxides, because silicon is still as uh, a role in this type of uh, applications for high speed electronics. Nevertheless, this is, I don't want to compete. This is an alternative, because for some applications, it is impossible to use conventional silicon, and we are using alternatives. But and as I used to say to my students, we don't have bad materials. Depends on always in the application you are looking for. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tessa, and she asked me to asked me to read it. So Tessa says, you mentioned disposable electronics. Do you think these should be the future, particularly with respect to SDGs? What would be sustainable? What would uh, be sustainable with the, the ideal technology, and what are the restraints? Okay, this is, I'm suspect, but this is a, an ideal technology because at the end you can recycle all these materials and uh, they don't, we, you don't have any type of problem. Either using glass, uh, you can uh, use again recycled glass with all these metal oxides. In, indeed, some of them belong, are already in the composition of the glasses that we are using in our windows. So it is, uh, there is no problem in terms of uh, recyclability. Okay, um, any more questions? If not, I just have a, one very quick last question. You mentioned that uh, your group since the beginning um, always had this thought in mind of uh, environmentally friendly materials. Yeah. In terms of policy, something that is being discussed a lot uh, everywhere in Europe, but also elsewhere is the uh, European uh, Green New Deal. I was yeah. just wondering uh, if you're collaborating with that in any way, if uh, in projects involving um, the European Commission or something yes, contributing sure. in the direction of that. Yes, we co uh, cooperate and we are perfectly aligned with this concept, not only from now, but, <laughs> but previously, yes. Uh, right. We are fully aligned and also we convince some uh, projects and some calls of the European Commission in, in, that, in that regard. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, last chance. Are there any last questions that you want to know about transparent electronics? <laughs> also, la last year I received an award from the European Commission because uh, since two years ago, the European Commission wants to give an award to projects that have impact with the society. And the, the name of the prize is Horizon Impact Award. And I apply my first ERC with this invisible project with transparent electronics, and I got it because uh, these, uh, the, the applications are very high. And also we have a, a strong collaboration with Samsung we have a patent and some of the, these materials are, are already applied in, in devices, in, in our devices by us. And I got this prize. Uh, I have been awarded by the European Commission last year. Yeah. Because sometimes, of course, science is always, all, all, all science is important, but uh, I'm an engineer. So I used to work with, uh, with more applied things Usually, I don't use the word Eureka in my lab. I use the word Funciona. It works <laughs> because we are making devices and they need, at the end, they need to work or a sensor. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I, I, if I may speak as Portuguese myself, I think we're, uh, we're all very proud of Professor Fortunat for the work she has done. I, I yeah. think, as scientists, you you work, uh, you like working in fundamental things, but if your actual research then starts yes. going out into the real world, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. The, it's the best. Uh, oh, we have another question. Uh, let me find you. Uh, uh, where is it? So I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, if not, I'll read. Yeah. Hey. Uh, good. Uh, okay, it's evening here, so I'll say good evening. Uh, right. Uh, so my question was that uh, currently, so I'm more acquainted with the condensed matter physics side of things. So there, there's a big hype and talk about like topological materials, topological objects, and the optical properties of these things, the electronic properties of these things. So what I wanted to know that uh, currently we're in a very infant stage when it comes to these things, at least I think. But uh, like in your opinion, what do you think the future has to hold for such materials and whether they can be used in such contexts, like electronic and optical contexts? I guess it is uh, 
it is uh, it it will be possible uh, because the besides the the the, the electrical properties, the optical properties of these materials, we can also use these materials in different forms, not only in the form of a film, a thin film, but also in a form of nanomaterial, a nanostructure or a nanowire. And since uh, we are also pushing the limits in terms of electrical mobility or other uh, properties, also we can exploit the, the material of these uh, metal oxides at the nanoscale. So now, nowadays, for example, we are also pushing because in terms of uh, thin films, they work quite well, but also we are pushing the, the limits and we have now several projects exploiting the properties of these at the, even at quantum wires, quantum at a very, very small scale. But I guess it is also possible, also with the topological uh, materials, yeah. Especially for applications where you need to have some conductor and especially if you need to have some transparent conductor, because also you have these metal, these zinc oxide or other combinations, you can exploit ferroelectric properties. You can exploit uh, even solar cells. If you, if you, you can have a transparent solar cell but not for the visible part, but for the UV radiation, because usually these materials, they are wideband gap uh, semiconductors. So you have a lot of different <laughs> applications, not only for the planet Earth, but also for the entire solar system. Thank you. Um, any more questions? We still have some time left. If not, I, I think we can close here. I'd like to thank once again, Professor Elvira Futunat for okay. having accepted our invitation and being here today. Uh, it was an incredible talk and I'm sure uh, not just me, but everyone else, we, we enjoyed uh, well, the possibility of you sharing all this knowledge with us. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your invita invitation and I wish you all the uh, big, a big success for uh, all of you and for your future uh, future careers okay thank you and be happy and <laughs> safe keep safe <laughs> bye bye it was thank a pleasure you. bye one minute uh, yeah go ahead sorry uh, let me just uh uh yes yeah, so Thank you, everyone. That was the end of the speaker schedule. We had nine speakers. We tried to get a range of different fields, different time zones, so that at least uh, no matter where in the world you're joining us from, you'd be able to at least join uh, some lectures. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed. Uh, I tried to be as unbiased as possible and not just get things exclusively in my field. Um, and yeah, any feedback, anything you may want to um tell us feel free to either email the oc or email me um this is probably the last time you're hearing from me so i'm not going to give the word to the oc back in porto and uh goodbye from cambridge bye <laughs>